Like many Australians, I love having a beer. But like so many others, I've become increasingly concerned about the impact that climate change is going to have on the Australian landscape and the planet on whole. And I've never really thought about the connection between the two. I mean, beer is an agricultural product, it's a crop. It can have a negative or a positive impact on the planet. So what's beer even made of? What's the process? And is my beer drinking impacting climate change? So I popped down to my local to see if anyone else had the answers. Have you ever thought about how your beer impacts the planet? No. Um, no. Not really. You can elaborate a little bit if you would like to. I haven't really, but I suppose that is something I should have thought about. Not really, no. Do you know how it's made? At the brewery. <laughs> Yep, there's a, there's a bit of barley. Comes from hops. And wheat. And hops. Malt. In like big drums. The yeast creates a sugar which creates the alcohol within the beer. Yeah, a lot of cropping, a lot of harvesting, and a lot of drinking. <laughs> is the environment something that you think about normally? It is, yes. I would like to say I'm relatively environmentally conscious. But not about beer. But not about beer. Alcohol, I think people think about less than other produce. Yeah, thanks for your time, guys. Cheers. Thanks, mate. So it's not just me, but I guess the first step to understanding how my beer drinking might be impacting the planet is to understand how it's made. So what is beer even made of? Well, beer has four main ingredients. Hops. Hops are flowers, which are dried and added throughout the brewing process to give bitterness, flavour and aroma. Malt. Malt is barley or other grains that have gone through various processes to extract starches. It's milled, mashed, boiled and cooled, creating a sugary liquid called wort. Yeast. Yeast converts sugars into alcohol when fermented. Water. We know what that is, but it's added throughout various stages of the process. Basically, there's a lot more nature in beer than I ever considered, and a lot of energy. But I still don't really know its impact on the environment. Luckily, I actually have a mate who works in this space, so I'm just going to give him a quick call and see if there's anything he can tell me. Hey James, how are you going? Hey Jake, I'm good man, how are you? I'm really good. I actually have a question for you. I've been thinking a little bit about how my beer drinking might contribute to climate change, and I don't really have a clear answer. I thought you might know. Is there anything you can tell me? Well, I've got some really awesome friends who are not just growing the ingredients, but actually shifting to regenerative practices, who I think you should meet. You keen for a road trip? I'm always keen for a road trip. Alright, let's do it. And just like that, it was time to hit the road. I packed the car full of gear, chucked my best flanny in my bag, grabbed my Cobra, and I was on my way. Hi, Mum. Yeah, I just on a road trip. Mate. Yeah, I'm driving to save you. Yeah, All right, love you. I was headed to Bemboka, five hours south of Sydney, to visit Ryefield Hops. My name's Jade, started the farm with Karen and Morgan. We all grew up here, so Morgan grew up in Bemboka. This farm used to be a dairy farm, so my father was a dairy farmer. So once this idea with Jade popped up about growing hops, we just jumped at it. Ryefield Hops is a family owned business which opened in 2016. It's dedicated to producing sustainable hops for the Australian craft beer market by using regenerative agricultural practices. Put simply, regenerative agriculture is all about biodiversity, focusing on ecosystem and soil health. Whereas industrial agriculture is characterised by monocropping, with the heavy use of synthetic pesticides and fertilisers, which leads to soil erosion and depletion. In nature, like how does a hops plant normally grow? It's got little hooks on the bine here. It's called a bine with a B. It uses those hooks and weaves its way up a structure. So Jade was brewing in Sydney and um, basically just dabbling and brewing. Yeah, I was reading about hops and obviously they're a plant, which interests me. Started researching what they needed to grow. The microclimate here in Bemboka matched up with, to what they needed. With hops you need a certain latitude, so the, the day lengths are quite long. In winter they need to stay dormant, so for that they need a cold winter, so frost or snow are good, and we have lots of frost here in Bemboka. And water, so we've got a creek just adjacent to the hop field, and basically that'll be our water source. I would definitely like to see more thought going into what you're 
trying to produce, whether or not it's achievable, but at what cost. So you might be able to grow amazing cotton crops in the middle of the desert, but you're going to need a huge amount of water. So where is all that water coming from? So you're taking it from somewhere. But if you just continually take, that land is going to get worse and worse and worse. And then, say, when my kids grow up, if I just robbed this land, if this was not an area to grow hops, it's not going to be much for them, is it? Um, yeah, one of our big things here that we're focusing on is soil health and building the soil structure, the organic matter content in there, but also the soil life of the bi biology. So that's the microbes, the worms. Jade has put a lot of time and effort into working out what draws down carbon. If you have a bare soil and you have a really hot day, probably the first 50 mil of that soil will get up to about 70 degrees, which nothing survives, not even a seed, it just burns it. So if we have cover crops in, protect that soil as much as we can without tilling it or ripping it up. So the more green that we have, the more carbon that you're sucking out of the atmosphere. With the 12 acres, last year worked out we sequestered 100 tonnes. So that's all the plants doing the work. So they take it out of the atmosphere through their roots and into the soil. 100 tonnes of carbon pulled from the atmosphere from just 14 acres. That roughly offsets the energy use of 70 homes in a year. Considering globally we use 4.6 billion acres for crops, the potential to reverse our carbon emissions is staggering, just from cover crops. So what cover crop species do we have? Um, we've got the radish here, the daikon radish, which has self-seeded a lot through here, so that's just starting to grow up. That's also part of our winter cover crop mix. So that's is that the one that grows? Yeah. A daikon radish can grow up to about six to eight inches at the head, and it could be up to about two foot long. So what happens after that is we'll take the heads off that daikon, so it will die. So then that feeds all our worms and all our, our friends down underneath. It also leaves a great big hole, which then aerates the soil as well. The other big function it does is provide beneficial habitat for insects. We use integrated pest management here, so we don't use any insecticides or pesticides. So we have an excellent bug population here, and we promote beneficial bugs to take care of our bad bugs, so aphids for example. And so ladybirds, you want a big ladybird population, that just does all the work for you. Instead of tilling and running our ploughs through and burning diesel and things like that, we just try and use, we try and find plants that can do the same kind of job without starting a tractor. When drought and bushfires swept through much of eastern Australia, the team at Ryefield lost almost 100% of their crops. Having also received no rainfall the year prior, the bushfires wiped out the few hops that had survived the drought. The outlook was grim. For that year, it was a year that we had planned and, and did carry it out to have a massive expansion for the farm. So we went from a very small, like half an acre, to every year expanding a small amount. So we had two, basically two acres. We decided to go bigger and we put in another 10 acres. Yeah, we had all the poles in, all the trellis in, and we had about 5,000 plants that we were putting into the ground, and just over half of those basically died because there wasn't enough moisture in the ground, there wasn't enough water in the creek to water them. So we were trucking in water um, to get them through through that year. So it was unfortunate that our expansion year was the yeah extreme extreme drought year and then getting into the, the bushfires and stuff. You know, we've been directly impacted by that, so what we can do here, that's what we have control over, is to be able to um, make those changes here on a smaller level, which then obviously transfers into the quality of our hops, but then also transfers out to the local community, to the global population as a whole, and that's how we see regenerative agriculture fitting into our farm and what we do. Yeah, so you'll walk through here and there's heaps of spiders and heaps of different insects and it's all really alive, which is really, really positive thing because you've got a healthy network of, you know, plant and animal life working together. Now we've found sheep do the perfect job for us, so we bring sheep in. So the sheep have been great. <laughs> you want everyone to be doing work that they're happy to do, that they get something from it. So the sheep, sheep obviously get, you know, super nutritious, diverse food. So they strip that, which is something that we need to do anyway. 
at the end of the growing season that gives good um, ventilation and air circulation at the bottom of the plants. Yeah, we'll be um, incorporating them into our whole area next year. And hopefully we'll just get the plants to the top and then put the sheep in here and then just we wait till harvest. That's what we're hoping. As the day came to a close, I grappled with just how many benefits there are to regenerative farming, which seemed to jar against the fact that most farmers don't farm this way. But why? When working in harmony with nature makes for a better product and a healthier land. It just makes sense. It's a very uplifting thing to learn about. It's exciting to come back to nature and treat nature as something that, you know, is pretty good at what it does because mm. <laughs> it's been doing it for a long yeah, time. Yeah, it is. It is. It's, it's a pro at what it does, yeah. you know. It's just like trying to work with nature rather than against it, really, you know. That's an it's always the boss. <laughs> yeah. yeah, totally. Next stop on the road trip, I stop by the Big Country Music Festival in Berry to see people from rural and regional Australia think about the environmental impact of their beer drinking. Some questions while you're setting up. Please? <laughs> Do you understand the process of making beer? Yeah, it's, um, it's in barley, hop, hop. Um, yeah. Comes from wheat and barley and all that sort of stuff, yeah. Something else. Do you ever consider about what beer does for CO2 emissions and these kind of things? No. Not real big on the climate change thing. It's too enjoyable. <laughs> You, you, gotta, you gotta drink it while you can. You don't believe in it? Oh, I wouldn't say I don't believe in it, but it's not gonna affect my beer drinking choice. Well, would you be interested in drinking a beer that was more sustainable? I don't know, you're gonna supply it. If it's cold and it's worthwhile trying, we'll try it. You wouldn't wouldn't sway your choice? No. <laughs> Sorry. This information needs to be put out there a bit more. Maybe it might sway my beer Maybe choice. There should be a documentary about it. should be a documentary about it. But if it tastes like shit, we'll tell you that shit, throw it in the bin. <laughs> well, there you have it. Stop being a greenie and let's go back to the regrowth. <laughs> well, that's the whole idea. Cheers. <laughs> As I put my arm back in its socket, I thought, it seems like whether you're from the country or the city, Australians aren't putting much thought into beer beyond how it tastes. But surely if people knew there was a better way, we'd all pick it, right? If hops can be farmed sustainably, how about barley? What about all the energy it takes to malt barley? I travelled to Voyager Craft Malt in Witten for a few nights to find out. Hey right. mate, Jack. Stu. Nice to meet you. Hey, mate. Welcome. Pretty amazing facility you have here. Grow barley over there and turn into malt just behind the doors here. You want to go check it out? Let's go check it out. Stu agreed to give me the grand tour where I got straight to the hard hitting questions. How much uh, beer is in, like, oh, is that hard to say? Yeah, I've, you know, I've, I need to get it tattooed on my arm somewhere. I've always got to kind of work backwards from... Um, um, Put you on the spot here. Yeah. So it's two and a half kegs in a bag. So one of those does about 80 kegs. So a lot. A lot more than you think. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But again, all, all of this has started life as a, you know, as a single seed in, in the ground yeah. somewhere in a paddock around here. So um, without any of that that happens in the paddock, None of this is possible, and none of the beer and, and spirits that we drink and take for granted is possible either. So, for all of, of mankind's achievements, we owe our existence to six inches of topsoil and the fact that it rains. Um, we can't do anything about the rain, but that six inches of topsoil, we've got direct control over that. And, you know, it, it's an ecosystem. And if you look at the way that we've been treating that in a conventional farm with the amount of chemicals and, and synthetic fertilizers, it's crazy to think that that's just been normal. So I think that for me, regenerative farming is all about growing the soil rather than growing a crop. My name's Stu Whitecross. I'm one of the co-founders of Voyage Craft Malt, uh, which is an on-farm malt house based here, actually just on the other side of those trees in the Riverina, New South Wales. Voyager Craft Malt breaks trends with traditional industrialised malting by growing barley on the same site that it's malted, which also gives visitors the opportunity to connect with their sustainable practices. So I grew up on a fourth generation cereal grain growing family. Uh, I grew up there and all I ever wanted to do was, was go back on the farm and probably one of the most important lessons I learnt was that uh, farming is a tough game and you're basically um, at the mercy of, of mother nature. The farm wasn't really going to sustain myself uh, and, and my family, so I went off to university, got into home brewing, met a girl who was studying winemaking, and in an attempt to, to impress her and her family, thought I needed to learn a little bit about wine. Um, the girl ended up becoming my, my wife, and I got to see how grapes were treated in that winemaking process, and related that back to the grain that we were growing on our farm. 
kind of felt quite robbed and cheated that we weren't, and we never got the same recognition and we never knew where our grain ended up in this commodity based system that, that most grain growers are farming in. So we kind of set out to, to change that by starting a, a beer or a brewing company that took locally grown grain and turned it into a community owned beer. Stu then gave me a crash course on the first stage of the malting process. But the grain gets harvested there, trucks then bring it back, come over this pit, elevator here, takes it all the way, to, all the grain all the way to the top. So that's this turn head with all these like arms coming in, it's like a bit of an octopus. Rotate around and distribute it to all these different vessels and it'll come along this conveyor, drop down into whatever silo we tell it to. And then when it's time to start malting, we take it from the silos, we clean, run it through that cleaner and down into the steep tank, just in there where it gets wet with water. Um, which is the first stage of the malting process. It's quite a uh, contraption you've got. Yeah, it is. It is. Like, this might seem big, but on a, on a scale of the way that malting's been done, this is yeah. tiny. Like having this system where it's going into all the individual things is how you're keeping that traceability. Exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. Once we look like that, for us, we set this facility up um, to, to let consumers know that beer is an agricultural product yeah. and it starts here in the ground, out in these paddocks. So Something that's really cool about this facility is that the crops are right there. You can imagine the energy that saves alone uh, from not having to truck it uh, thousands of kilometres across the country or even internationally. It really makes a difference and it's quite a visual one being able to see it from up here. We place a fairly big focus on sustainability in our own malt house and we did an audit recently of our carbon emissions and we've been doing a great job. But when we sat down and did this audit, it made us to actually look a little bit further beyond the four walls of, of, our, of our malt house and we started looking further up the supply chain and soon discovered that more than 50% of our emissions came from in the paddock. So here we were doing all these wonderful things, thinking that we're making a massive difference. And the biggest difference we could make was to choose grain that had been grown on a regenerative farm and have nowhere near the amount of nitrogenous fertiliser or synthetic chemicals used. And once we made that choice to, to move down that path, we cut out 50% of our emissions straight away. 50% just from changing to regen farm crops. Again, why isn't everyone farming like this? Farmers don't want to be throwing on the amount of chemical and, and synthetic fertiliser they are. They're, they're environmentalists at heart. It's just this is the system that they, they have to perform in to get paid what they need to. If there's an option for them not to do that, and we're now able to offer um, farmers to, to do that, then um, we've, we're seeing them take that offer up. And we've become really quite inspired by what they're doing, which is spurring us on to try and do even more now. Okay, so where are we now? It looks mate, quite different. It is, yeah, mate. So we're, uh, this is our biochar facility. It produces the heat that we need during that kilning process. It takes a waste product, in this case, walnut shells, converts it into a, a high value product. But for us in the malt house, it generates a lot of heat. And it's that heat that we're able to harness and utilise in the malt house rather than burning fossil fuels, um, you know, using electricity or, or, or diesel or gas. And then you've got an added bonus of a byproduct that you can then utilise back on, it, on our crops. Yeah, look, it, it's it's been a big uh, a big part of our story, but also a big part of our success in being able to reduce our, our costs of the product, but do it in a, in a sustainable way. It's got a great story. And where the walnuts normally come from, they're coming from the farmers. They are, yeah. So there's a big walnuts uh, walnut processing facility just up the road. There's a lot of walnuts growing in the area here, yeah. and it's not just walnuts. We can process grape mark, rice hulls. Being the food bowl of New South Wales here, we've got an abundance of agricultural waste product: cotton gin trash, council green waste. And so normally they'd be faced with the challenge of what to do with their waste. Yeah, well, exactly. And a lot of it's just basically put out onto on the farmland to try and mulch down, which can sometimes you know, take 10, 20 years. It's a win-win for everyone, really. Like it's uh, it solves a lot of problems all in the one yeah, exactly. kind of little space. Can we come and take a look at the kiln and see? Yeah, let's check it out. As a farmer myself, I always just did what my dad had done and yeah. he'd farm the way that his father had done. It's funny, that's like the same common theme at Ryefield was even though they grew up on the farm, they lived on the property, they were new to growing hops and they came at it with a different kind of yeah. perspective. It's nice that we're all kind of encouraging and, and inspiring each other to, to do better. And you know, it, you solve one problem and you create a byproduct that also solves another problem. Yeah, it yeah, seems exactly, like yeah. when you think about outside the box sustainably, you're actually making life easier for yourself more ways than one. The last stop for the day was to taste some wort. Whereas Stu and I had the chance to chat about how crops can be affected by the volatility of the Australian environment. 
how do you find a consistent flavour over a long period of time when we have so much variation in the landscape? That's a great question. Look, it is a challenge, but I guess at the end of the day, we're dealing with an agricultural product that does have seasonal variants, and, and winemakers use that to their advantage. They call it provenance or vintage. Consumers need to realise that food and fibre that is produced on farms is variable based on, on the climate yeah. we're living in. And you know, we're starting to see different sized carrots and consumers more willing to, to take smaller potatoes or you know, all these kind of things. So it's slowly starting to happen. I think that beer and spirits can play in that space as well. There's only really been a very small part of history where we've expected our bananas to look exactly the same size. So I guess the same kind of thing with beer drinking. We should want to be looking for new experiences, even if it's the same product we're engaging with. Yeah, yeah exactly. There's certainly things we can do to minimize that. There's also things we, we, we'd like to do to highlight some of those things as well yeah. sometimes. So we're on the road again, and something that's sticking in my mind as we leave Witten is Stu's commitment to traceability. I had felt so disconnected to the ingredients in my beer and where it came from, and it's interesting to think about how different that is to wine. Well, we've got the regenerative hops, we've got the regenerative malt, but that's only half the story. What about the brewing process? And is there even a beer that I can drink that they're in? Well, we're headed to Byron Bay now to check out Stonewood Brewery, where they've been experimenting brewing with the regen hops and malt. I'm pretty excited to give it a taste, and it's just 12 hours away, so let's go. We've been all over the state, we've been to the hops farm, we've been to the malting facility. We're finally here now at Stonewood Brewery to see it all come together. I'm pretty excited, let's go. First up, I met Scotty, who was eager to show me something that looked pretty familiar. So this is the regen hops from Ryefield. Yes. We saw that literally on the vine before, so it's pretty cool that it's here now. And yep, so this is what we put, and we, we generally pop these into the kettle for our bitterness, and uh, there you go. With the regen beer, are we losing out on taste or quality at any point? No, no, we're not. No, quality is exactly the same, flavour's the same. Um, there's no, no issues there at all, but it's regenerative malt that we're using, which is fantastic. So it just tastes as good. We're happy with that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. so that's exactly. cool. Next, we sat down with Head Brewer Keelan yeah. to find out what Stone yeah, Woods yeah. plans are for the Regen beer. I think it's vital for punters to know uh, how beer is made, but not just how it's made, where it comes from. It's an agricultural product, and without agriculture here in Australia, we wouldn't have beer. Stone Wood has decided to use Regen ingredients in our beers, and that's for a higher purpose, and that's really to bring it to the mainstream. Last year, we incorporated some Regen malt into our core range of beers, so Cloudcatcher, Green Coast, and Pacific Ale, and it resulted in us using uh, over 100 ton of Regen malt. By using Regen ingredients, there's been no negative impact to the beer, uh, and only a positive impact to the, the community and the, and, the, and the planet. I love using Regen ingredients because it allows me to use my, my passion and industry to help influence change, and beer is such a great vehicle for, uh, for doing that. And this is our Regen beer, NRB, the Northern Rivers beer. NRB's been made with uh, some of the best Regen malt and hops from our, our good friends at Voyager and Ryefield. It's a beer that's been brewed for our community and it's a beer that's simply good to drink. It's not very often you have the opportunity to work on something which can change the, the future of the world we live in. So what is the future of the world we live in? What if we don't change? I had the opportunity to meet with Damon Gamo, a fellow filmmaker and idol of mine, who has travelled the globe asking that same question about our future. And yeah, I was pretty nervous. Hey Damon, thanks so much for chatting today. Pleasure. You've been on your own regen journey, but before we get to that, I just want to talk a little bit more about where we're at globally and what the, the outlook is. <laughs> well, it's a massive question to start with. I think we all know that we've got a future of, of shocks and um, probably more pandemics and more climate events. How do we start to regenerate and, and heal the damage that we've done? But also how do we build up our own resilience and security in our own place, in our local communities? And these big centralised institutions just aren't appropriate for where we're at now. We've even seen that with, with Russia and Ukraine, what's happened recently and how that's affected energy supplies around the world. So to rely on a six continent supply chain in a world of instability is kind of madness. 
We have to change the ways. In fact, we're going to be forced to do it. Whether we want it to do it or not, we will either crash land the plane or we will gently land the plane and make sure that everyone is, <laughs> as many people as possible are looked after. I see that as an enormous opportunity. Enough people want something different that uh, I'm quite optimistic about where we might get to in the next 60 or 70 years. When we think about doing things for the environment, we often have to think about what we're, what we're taking away from our daily lives. Right. Something that struck me is that Regen isn't really about that. When I've talked to people that you know, haven't been along with me for the ride about Regen and you know, about regenerative agriculture, and it's usually a head scratcher for people that haven't really heard about it. How far do you think we have to go in terms of getting consumers on board and encouraging more pr producers to engage? Yeah, I think with Regen Ag, we're, we're pretty close to a tipping point. I mean, really, our agricultural practices have, have inflicted some of the biggest damage that we've seen on the planet, not just with emissions, but in clearing landscape, using chemicals on the soil, um, drying out our soil so they don't hold moisture as much. I mean, reversing that is one of the most profound solutions that we can start to enact. It's been extraordinary what's happened even in the last five years, particularly in this country. We've got some of the, the, the pioneers in the world, really, around Regen Ag. And I've met so many of those farmers now and walked on their properties. And it transforms themselves because they've spent their life killing things, really, and fighting nature. And when they start to turn that around and see what happens to their landscape and the native grasses and the animals that come back and all that diversity and the healthy foods, that's such a meaningful change to their landscape that it can't help but affect them. Very soon we're going to get to a point where we're going to be able to accurately measure for the consumer what was the quality of that food, what was the farm it was grown on, what was the carbon in the soil, what was the nutrient density, how were they treating their biodiversity and water. That's a game changer because suddenly who's going to buy that monoculture grown high chemical carrot when you can see the value of a rich carrot and see the colour and the nutrition. But that's where the storytellers come into play, that we need to be telling these stories more and more. Because once people see it and they feel it, they go, oh, there's something right about that. How do I learn more? Or I can see this community or this great innovation that's happening, like you're doing with the Regen Beer. You know, you tell that story and all the benefits that comes with that. I mean, suddenly that beer tastes very different to someone that's drinking it because it's actually helping to improve and regenerate the planet. Yeah, exactly. uh, and, and that's the ad campaign we need out there. It's like you can actually drink to save the planet. Yeah. You know? And as well as doing that, you're also potentially sparking conversation with someone that doesn't know as much and, exactly. is, and, and they can learn. Yeah, so. and what a beautiful cultural acupuncture point for Australia than through beer to yeah, start exactly. a conversation. It's like if we can get beer onto this, if we can get our athletes onto this stuff, we're going to change this country in a matter of moments because they're the, 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 the crucial moments. The That's right. Yeah. Casting my mind back to the 2019 2020 fires in Sydney and we got used to the fact that the sky was orange uh, for like a good month. And then COVID came along and we got used to being in lockdown. And that's right. something that kind of scares me about the future is and how quickly we get used to scenarios. And we talk about a lot about storytelling and, and painting that picture for the future that we don't have to get used to kind of some weird climate hellscape. We can actually create something that's better than now. That's right. And that adaptability works in our favor as well is that if you planted people suddenly into like the 60s where we didn't have anywhere near as many material uses, we don't, people were still happy. They loved their life. They probably connected with each other in, in more than they do now. Because when you're on your deathbed, you're not going to talk about all the assets you've accumulated. You're going to talk about the friendships you had and that time in nature or that great trip you went on with some mates. Like that's the richness. That's the values shift we have to move to. And that to me is what regeneration is. Regenerating not just our landscapes, but what we value, what we measure in society and what we think is a successful life. I met so many incredible people on my adventure. My hope for the future hadn't just been restored, it had been invigorated. And it was hard to believe I'd gotten to learn all this because of a random thought I had over a beer. But there was one more person I had yet to speak to, the man who put me on this trip in the first place. James, good to see you mate. Good to see you in 3D. Yes. Welcome. So it's quite a journey that you've sent us on. We've been all over the state. 
but it's not lost on me that the park we're sitting in right now, not so long ago, was underwater. And that kind of really brings it home. Yeah, yeah, we're kind of at ground zero here. So earlier this year, there was a massive flood here. This was all underwater. Three years ago, we were on water restrictions and there was a drought and bushfires in the hinterland. And two years before that, there was a flood again. So we've had two one in a hundred year floods in the last five years. In just two days, in February 2022, 777 mils of rain fell on Mwilimba and the Tweed River rose 6.5 metres, the highest it had ever risen. Many locals were left stranded and community members became the first responders in boats and jet skis. we all saw as Australians watching the coverage of the floods was how the community came together in the aftermath of that, helping with the cleanup. So that's something that I've been thinking about a lot is the idea that community comes together after the fact. And it seems like the future is thinking about community at all, all stages. After the floods here earlier this year, Yes, there was all the terrible loss and suffering and, and devastation. There was a, an amazing moment where community just rallied together. People dropped everything that they were doing and just did whatever they needed to do to help one another. And there was, that was beautiful to see. So people want to help. People want to help one another and people want to live in harmony with each other and community. The trick is doing that proactively rather than reactively. We can't wait for these issues to happen. They're going to get worse and worse. So how do we be proactive? And it feels like that cycle of extreme weather events is just getting faster and faster. It's something that we've been learning on this journey is about cycles and systems and regenerative agriculture it just seeks to use a system that's evolved over billions of years. Regenerative agriculture is a great metaphor because what it's doing is rather than focusing on the yield of the crop and how do we maximise that yield, regenerative agriculture is saying how do we focus on the soil? and look after the soil and nurture the conditions, you know, and live in harmony with the natural cycles. And I think that's a metaphor for the broader context that we need to live. Like we've been smashed by floods here because of emissions, because of overdevelopment, because of poor agricultural practices in this region, which have caused all sorts of surface water runoff. So we've tried to keep nature out. Yeah. We can't do that. No. You know, we need to live in harmony with the cycles of nature and a great way to see that is through agriculture and regenerative farming. 200 years ago, this area was rainforest and wetland, you know, and here we are um, just down the road. We've got, yeah, lots of cane farms that have compressed the soil that are extracting all the nutrients from the soil. So when rain and storms happen, which they do in this area, it just hits it and runs off. So it makes these extreme weather events far worse. You've been to Ryefield Hops, you've been to Voyager and Witten, you know, Stone and Wood working with those great companies and practices, it lifts everyone up together, yeah. you know, so it improves the supply chain, it improves the, the beer and the, the product that Stone and Wood's able to sell, it improves the offering to customers and consumers, you know, so it's not a win-lose situation. Yeah. We can actually, it can be win-win-win along the way. We just have to consciously make that deliberate effort to go in that direction. Yeah, I think often as consumers, we think the environmental pathway means taking a hit somehow, means less quality product or, you know, in some cases it is more expensive, but that pr price comes down the more we choose to engage with products that are, you know, better for the planet. Yeah, that's it. You vote every day. You vote every day with your dollar. And so every time you're making a purchase, you're voting for the future that you want. There's opportunities for people and there's opportunities for businesses to take proactive steps. Yeah, why don't we go to the brewery and I can show you some of the stuff that we've implemented over the years. That'd be awesome. Sweet. We headed over to Stone and Woods Brewery in Mwilimba, which is only open to the public one day a year. It's where most of Stone and Woods beers are brewed, so I was lucky to have a special behind the scenes look, not often seen. Jack, here we are. Chuck these on, brother. All right, try the funny for the fluoro, finally. We'll go for a wonder. So you take me to a big bin. What's all this about? Yeah, this is just an example of what we've tried to do here at the brewery. So by us taking the care to actually separate out as many waste streams as we can, like the glass here, for instance, then we can make sure it goes to the best place. So these bottles actually go straight back to the supplier in Brisbane, where they crush them and then reuse them for new bottles. It's a pretty massive operation. This is the water and wastewater treatment system. So being a relatively big brewer in a relatively small town of only 10,000 people, yeah. the brewery actually needs to treat all of its own wastewater, otherwise it would be too much for the community system to handle. 
So we built and designed this whole wastewater treatment process, which takes the load off the community infrastructure. And then we also added on a water recycling element. So it's a filtration system that basically separates out all the impurities out of the wastewater and leaves us with just pure H2O. And that recycled water gets used in the brewery for like external cleaning, cooling, heating, and a few other non-products. So it doesn't actually go in the beer? It doesn't go in the beer. We have brewed beer before with it. It's totally fine to drink. Um, you know, we're just trying to, that's another thing we're trying to do is yeah. how do we break down, how do we use our products to break down some of those stigmas. It's yeah. funny that people don't want to drink recycled water given that water is always recycled. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's otherwise going to go through treatment, end yeah. up in the river and go back through another water yeah. treatment process anyway. Yeah. We're just trying to cut out that middleman here. Yeah. So, you know, it's not just what we do within the brewery, but it's also how do we advocate and use our products and use our practices to improve certain processes as well. And you want to take the town along for the ride with you, you're not taking from them or making no. Totally. Uh, it was only, I mean, we've had floods here, but it was only a few years ago that we were in a drought and we're on water restrictions. So we've got to reduce our resources here at the brewery as well. Totally. The border range is over there, which is basically the border between New South Wales and Queensland. And just tucked behind the clouds over there is Wollumbin, which is the indigenous name, which translates loosely to cloud catcher. So it's catching some clouds at the moment. It's the name of the beers. That's the name of one of the beers. Perfect. And um, that is the first part of the Australian mainland that gets sunlight every morning. So it's wow. a special part of the world. So you can see our solar system here. We've got a 100 kilowatt solar system, which we put on the brewery basically when we first built it. That did provide us about a quarter of the brewery's needs, but as the brewery's grown, that has dropped to about seven or eight percent of the electricity that the brewery uses. So that's when that philosophy came back in. So it's not just what we do here at the brewery, but what are we actually, who are our suppliers, who are we purchasing from? And that's when we started to look at, you know, green electricity deals. And we went with a local community owned electricity retailer who supplies all of our electricity. So once we maxed out what we could do on site, we then started looking outside the walls and see what we can actually bring in. And that kind of outside the wall thinking applies to the whole pipeline of the production. Totally. It's, it's, it's started with what we do within the brewery walls and then we started looking at what happens to our waste downstream and then we also started looking, hey, what's happening upstream? Yeah. Electricity or packaging materials or grain and, grain and hop supplies. It's easy to think that you put solar panels on and that's, you, f you fix the problem, but it's, it's one thing in a whole array of yeah. little things you can do here and there to make it much more sustainable. Yeah, I think there's a big thing about thinking about our place in the community and that includes the local community of this beautiful region and also the community within our industry. You know, it's, it's not just what we do, but it's who we interact with. Who are we partnering with? Who are we purchasing from? What's happening when it goes downstream? How are we helping our customers? We play a role in influencing that. So we started to put that lens on our sustainability efforts. Well, it's pretty cool. <laughs> Let's get down from here, it's scary. We're so lucky to live in Australia, a country that has tens of thousands of years of cultural respect for the land and love of the land. Living off the land and treating nature for the amazing, you know, organism really that it is. And I think it's a really inspiring opportunity that we have now as the next generations and for the future generations to get back to that, to, to take inspiration from indigenous culture and and work with the land, not against it. And, you know, I really feel like there's a lot of hope and that there are people that can see that now. So I'm really inspired by what you're doing and, um, you know, all the people that we've met that are leading the charge to really do things in a way that is better for all of us. Cheers to Regen Beers. I feel like maybe we're just starting to course correct and learn what we don't know from, you know, traditional history as well as applied in our modern context. So we're now at a stage where we're conscious of the negative impacts that we're having. That's a great first step. From there, we can make choices, we can make decisions, and we can take action. So that's where we're at now, is we're at a space where we actually have the ability to take positive actions and take positive steps. It's just about wanting to do that and putting that into practice. And we want to do it, so let's do it. <laughs> do it through beer. Yeah, and we can do it through <laughs> drinking beers. Like, that's the best thing about this whole journey, is that like, it's not that hard just to 
drink a skewy is a good thing and we can do it in a way that's doing good to the planet and not only taking away and that's such a cool notion to me that's yeah. the most inspiring part of this whole thing is how good's having a beer with a mate and feeling good about the where the planet's going yeah. as a result yeah It's hard, to, it's hard to wrap your head around how many steps there are in the process. When you look all the way upstream and downstream, so much goes into making it, but this is the fruit of all the hard labor, you yeah. know, the final product. Um, and you know, a cool way to look at it as we see all the beers going through the line here, yeah. we can't even keep up with demand. So as fast as it's going here, it's as fast as it's being drunk out there in the world. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, I guess we go have a beer now. Let's go enjoy one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. While this might look like an ordinary beer, it's anything but. It's an example of what can happen when people come together and pledge to find a better way. This beer is the result of clever, hardworking people who love beer, pledging to find a way to work with nature and not against it. It's not too late to change. The way that we've been farming is still relatively new compared to the billions of years the Earth has evolved to become really efficient at what it does. Regenerative agriculture seeks to learn from that knowledge and evolve it further, meaning we as consumers can still enjoy the products we like, just in a way that's better for the planet. As consumers, we can make an active choice. We can encourage brands that we love to do better and become part of the regeneration. And what better way to, to you know, to, to be essentially saving the, the, the world we live on is, is by drinking beer that's been uh, be farmed in that way. Like, it doesn't get any easier than that, does it? Yeah, it's pretty <laughs> <laughs> the, the problem is that it's solved by having a few skewies. <laughs>